Welcome back to The Breakfast. And it's time for our first hot topic. And uh, we'll be taking a look at the cost of insurgency in the country. Uh, we have as our guest, Reverend John Hayap. He's a chairman, Christian Association of Nigeria, Kaduna State. Reverend, you are welcome to the program. Thank you for having me and good morning to all Nigerians. Oh, welcome. Well, Reverend, I think the best place to start is to ask you what is going on in Kaduna even as we speak. What is the problem right now? Well, uh, as we speak, I am actually in Kaduna. I'm speaking to you from Sabon Tesha in Kaduna, precisely in Sabon GRA. And uh, people are out there doing their normal businesses. But the challenge we are facing at the moment is in the Sobo and some of the distant local governments, where bandits that we thought had flee, bandits that we thought that had been neutralized, bandits that we thought that have gone away are still having a field day going about killing, destroying innocent lives and properties of citizens, bringing back fear. Uh, even as we approach the new government, people are beginning to say, wait a minute, we thought we are getting out of this, but what is, uh, what is happening? Are we really out or there is something worse that is about to come? All right, so the concern is that lives are still being taken in that place, properties destroyed. Matter of fact, thousands have been killed. There is a saying by, uh, well, Gumsu, the, the daughter of the former uh, head of state in Nigeria, talking about General Abacha. That he, she, she says that if insurgency lasts for more than 24 hours, the government has a hand in it. Do you share this? saying by Gumsu Abacha in looking at the situation, the prolonged attacks on your state. Do you have any concerns that government may not be trustworthy? Truly speaking, I have said this and I want to repeat that our government have not done well. Our government have not been honest with us, neither have our government shown that she is in charge. Uh, what we find every day is the normal rhetoric uh, the manipulation of the situation and give a picture as if a lot has been done but nothing has been done. And I will say this without fear of contradiction. One of the reasons why, one of the reasons I have just realized is that it's simple and a cheap way of stealing our money. Because when government refused to deal with criminality like this, when government failed to deal with people killing lives like this, she just hide under these whole incidences and continue to siphon public one and say she's paying security. If you listen to the last report our government gave, the amount she is presenting out there that she spent for security, and then you see the killings going on. The report that is out there is the report from just one tribe. I think people must know the report of 500 and something people killed is just a report of ATF. ATF, but you have not said what happened. Uh, Chawe have not said what happened. Kaburo have not said what happened. And you know, in recent, most of the killings have been done in Kaburo in large number. The people in Sangha have not said what happened. Then you come to the uh, worst hit, that is the Adara, in Kaju, local government have not said what happened. And Chikun have not said what happened. So when you begin to put all these numbers together, you will wonder, how do we really still exist as a nation? that we ha and have government, that people can be killed in such number, property can be destroyed in such number, and nothing happened, no one is arrested, nobody has been brought to justice. Every day we just hear stories on television, stories on the pages of newspaper. It is very unfortunate. So government knows very well that our hand is soil in this matter. I, mean, I, I was going to ask you if the figures are really correct, because the figures before us are 518. Uh, people just in killed. Atep land, and, but they say, but they say it's Atep 18 land. villages. They said it's 18 villages. Are these 18 villages just within in Atep land? Just, just in, in Atep, Atep land. land. That's and one Atep, it, for our viewers to know. Kata or Atep is just one tribe in Zambon Katap local government, and Zambon Katap local government have four chiefdoms. 
There is the ATF chiefdom, there is the Baju chiefdom, there is the uh, Ekulu chiefdom, and there is also uh, Kamantan chiefdom. All in a, a jungle cut of local government. So we're just dealing with one tribe in one local government. And you know, if you've been following the stories of Kaduna State and the killings in South Kaduna, you know you heard about Kaburo. Kaburo is not on this people. You know you heard about uh, Manchok. Manchok is not on Marwa. Marwa is not on this people. You know you heard about killings in uh, Sangha. Sangha is not on this people. You know you heard about the killings in Kajuru, that is in Adaralan. These tribes are not in this figure. You've heard of the killing in Chawe. Chawe are not in this figure. I'm just, we're just speaking about one tribe in one local government that have four chiefdoms. Hmm. So what do you think is um, an estimated number, uh, if you might, uh, that has fallen? Because if 518 are just in one tribe, uh, what figure are we looking at as a total figure that might have been uh, victims of this insurgency? When you are dealing with our government, be careful when you use figure because they will just want if one dot of that figure is wrong, then they won't talk about the substance of the story. They will just use that as an excuse to cover a very important figure. But thousands of lives have been lost, period. Mm. All right. My question is haven't seen that these killings have continued year after year uh, with mutinous rampaging bandits attack village after village in different parts of the country we're talking about uh, not just kaduna bauchi is there zamfara is there sokoto is there and some other parts let's focus on kaduna for a minute what are the the things that the people are doing to protect themselves Apart from waiting for government and trusting government and not trusting government, because yeah. the issue of trust has been raised here. Uh, what are the people? Uh, have they resorted to any kind of self-help or are they just helpless and waiting for the worst to happen, even as they do not trust that government can help and save their lives and properties? Look, let, let me put it in this clear perspective. The people have been doing a lot to protect themselves. But this is where the challenge is. One, those who come to attack those people in their sleep come with sophisticated weapons. The fact that the other time I went to that community and I gathered all the clerics and I was advising them that we must intensify our effort in self-defense, we must bring strategy that we can protect ourselves. One of the leaders just after listening to me said, Pastor, we agree with what you say and we've been trying our best, but here is our ch the challenge. When you listen to the sound of the gun of these people, it will take a strong heart to stand. You are just coming with a den gun, with a stick, with a cutlass, and the sound of the gun alone will chase away thousands of youths that may have come courageously. That is one. Number two, we have reports from our people out there that anytime they even hear the sound and some of them pick courage and want to go and defend or render support, they will find the military coming to stop them to go and render support to that community that is under attack. But the same people who are destroying lives and killing people will have a field day to kill and destroy homes and go away, no arrest and no trace of where they come from. So why is the government interested in blocking the people from going after the criminals who are disturbing and denying them peace and then allowing the criminals to have a field day without doing anything? That's why if you read that report you are going through, you would see that the community even said they don't even trust the military that are there. In fact, that they categorically say that the commander who is in charge should be removed because he has compromised. There are many instances that will give that sometimes even people with knives and these dead guns will be arrested by security and they will come and drop them here in Kaduna or somewhere at the police cell for six months. They won't go to their farm. They have no other source of good livelihood. So when people want to defend themselves and they realize that they are at the mercy of what government determined that is self-defense and what is not self-defense, then that is where the real problem is. If not, we will. Our people are courageous, our people are not people who are given cheaply to fear, but we are having a situation where the bandits are on the other side. The institution that's supposed to protect us also is 
eating at us and creating unnecessary tension and even looking for excuse to arrest some of our youth and just lock them up. That is why the idea and the effort of self-defense have not yielded enough fruit. We have tried the issue of dialogue, the issue of peace, but this is another challenge we face. We are dialoguing with people who do not even know who are the insurgents. We are dialoguing with people who have no business. They may belong to the same tribe or the same identity of the insurgents, but they don't belong they are not with them. So the insurgents are people who don't belong to this same family or same other group that we are staying with. They are criminals who have vowed to terminate our people, take over our land and cause harm, harm on our people. Sadly, government that's supposed to protect lives and property is not protecting us, but actually hiding under some excuses and blaming people. You even want a situation where a real honest dialogue will come. No honest dialogue will come. You just hear blame game out there. I think that's why our people have just resolved to also pass on the same blame. Let the world know their story and know that, look, what you are hearing that they are trying to paint us black is like someone who have killed you, who cuts you hard and you are weeping, you are crying. Instead of coming to commiserate with you, he is now accusing you just to cover up. Well, paint for us a picture of how the Kaduna people survive now. L let's know how this insurgency has impacted on the economy of Kaduna State and its people. Let's know how you survive. Let me, let me, I'm going to just use one small statement to explain what you said. Yesterday, I had to send food home to the village. And when the driver was to leave, then someone was asking, what do you mean, Pastor? You mean from Kaduna, you are sending food to your parents and or to your relative in the village? And I said, yes, in the past, it was the responsibility of our parents to send us in the city food to augment the little salary we're having. But these days, they can't farm. They don't have food. If they go to farm, they won't come back alive. So many of them cannot even afford what to eat. That is the situation. Before you even talk about paying students' school fees, before you talk about medical bills, they don't even have what to eat. There are many families in many of our local communities that in the past four years have not harvested any crop. It is the same crop they will eat. It is the same harvest that they will sell and pay children's school fees. It is the same harvest that they will sell and pay medical bills. They don't have it. They are living in fear. They have no food. They have nowhere to go. And if they even try to make effort, they are arrested. So that's the kind of situation we are. So poverty has taken over the state. You will hear fantastic stories about constructions and others. It's just a city game or a city painting. There is nothing in the state. I was in Chawe a few weeks ago. Honestly speaking, you wouldn't even believe that this one is part of Nigeria. Obasani has been uh, elected as governor uh, of Cardinal State. He's going to take over from Nasser Erofai. And it's been said that he is uh, his anointed candidate. Um, how do you respond to the fact that a government you do not trust is handing over uh, the baton to the incoming governor? Well, uh, I will leave some response about this for another day, but let me put it this way. There is an effort from his team, from his transition team, to correct some of the wrongs. Uh, some of the, his inability to speak out his mind was because he wanted to win by all means and he didn't want to offend the man whom people say is his anointed candidate. But I want to say to Nigeria that even if it is a revised biological son that takes over from him, give them six months, you will know the difference, you will know the truth. There are certain things people will not do. When you have a man who has no heart, who has no sympathy, who do not care, who even look for controversy, <laughs> they, they, please don't tag everybody. I think I've known Uba for a very long time. I don't want to go into the politics of who, what is going on, but Uba cannot be a Rufai, so people shouldn't. But I can also say this for the uh, interest of the public. Yesterday, his committee reached out to me through one of the most respected persons in the committee. Look, they want to meet us. They want to discuss with us. What are those things that went wrong in the outgoing administration that we want to see correct? So for me, even that effort alone shows that there may be hope going forward. So if they do it genuinely, we trust that it will be hope. There's one thing about honesty. When you are honest to anything, uh, our holy book says actions are judged according to intention. If you have an honest intention about bringing peace, an honest intention about uniting the people, an honest intention about building a better society, God will bless it and prosper it and you will see cooperation from people. So already there is effort by them to reach out 
Uh, we didn't just agree on the date they wanted, but we've agreed on a time now. I'm going to be available. Uh, my colleague, my team will be available. Let's talk about this together with them. So since there's even that opening, let's assume that something good is about to happen. Okay. Um, should insurgency end today in Kaduna? What are some of the things that you feel Kaduna will need to be able to bounce back? You see, anybody coming in to lead Kaduna now, one of his most important agenda should be uniting the people. You don't fight insecurity with a divided team, with a divided community, with a divided society, with a divided interest. No. Yes, you could have people who think differently, but there are certain things that unite the people. I have said this and I want to repeat. There was a time we suffered this kind of thing, but we had a governor who so something different and brought something different and begin to reach out to people and begin to work with people and begin to unite the people and begin to meet those needs of the people. It wasn't about sharing money. He's, he was even an accountant whom you know will not just give out money everything. It is about relationship. It is about listening to the audience of people. It's about understanding the pains of the people. It's about recognizing who those people, their uniqueness, and what they think they can bring to the table. And gradually things started stabilizing that we were able to achieve a nine year without violence, without killings in Kaduna State. Unfortunately, the 2011 post-election violence brought us back. And since then, certain developments have continued and we've not been able to go back. But that means that we can go back. To what did we do that time that was right? What were those things that we did that brought about unity, brought about understanding? We can just go back and look at the, 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 the time we are in, do some little adjustment, do some little amendment, put some few things that will improve, meet up the time now, and we can move on. Probably we may even go beyond nine years now. We may even go up to 15. We may even go up to 20 years. I do believe that when we are able to unite the people, build trust among the people, encourage the people to speak. I'm speaking, let me be honest to you here, that even peace practitioner in this state end up just wasting funds because you go to a community, talk to the community, call on them for, to unite, call on them to be peaceful, but in the next one week or one month, the action or utterance from the government house can just destroy all that you have built and the people will start looking at themselves as enemies. So even if you want to build peace, you will only build peace when the leaders are honest in finding peace and the leaders are willing to see the people united. But if a leader will go among some people and instigating them against one another, thinking he's playing a smart game, divide and rule, then you will find this kind of situation. So bandit will say, wait a minute. We can do this, they'll be divided, they'll be fighting among themselves, and nobody will even care to know who are was doing the evil. Reverend Joseph Hayap, Khan uh, Chairman, Kaduna State. Reverend, we do hope that Kaduna stops bleeding, and indeed Nigeria stops bleeding, because this insecurity, this rising spate of insecurity, has affected every sector of the nation's economy and we cannot afford to have this go on i share the hope that you're having uh, as the this administration winds down and you're hoping that the incoming administration of obasani will give you peace and tranquility and prosperity in kaduna state that's what we join you to hope for thank you so much for your time thank you too for having me and thank you for hoping like us so please let's pray together and then we walk towards achieving thank you the breakfast continues in a moment. Stay with us.